folklore, the beliefs, traditions, and culture of the people. Passed on in the most part through the spoken word, folklore expresses our values, our shared ideas with others. It is both how we were and how we are. Without a record, our customs and traditions may become lost to us in the present, but under the surface, we still draw on them. We still know. It's time to recall our forgotten history and to record the new. This is the Folklore Podcast. Cryptozoology is viewed by most people as a form of pseudoscience. In many ways this is the case, but it really depends on what aspect of the investigation undertaken by cryptozoologists you are looking at. The field of cryptozoology, research into lost or legendary animals known as cryptids, really has two strands. One part of this is looking for evidence of, or examples of, animals which were thought to be extinct, or have not been sighted for some time. This takes in the more zoological aspect of the field. The other is the search for evidence of legendary creatures, such as the Sasquatch or various lake monsters. This latter aspect lies more within the field of folklore. Academically, Cryptozoology tends to be dismissed because of its reliance on anecdotal evidence, or oral tradition, although some more scientific areas such as the fossil record are sometimes used. It is this investigation into oral dissemination of stories which makes the field of cryptozoology of some interest to us as folklorists. I'm Mark Norman creator and host of the Folklore Podcast. In this episode, we feature another guest lecturer to give us a talk on their area of research. Paul Michael Donovan is a PhD candidate at Federation University in Ballarat, Australia, specialising in indigenous and colonial cultural heritage, including artefacts and folklore with a basis in ethno-history. Paul Michael is passionate about local colonial history, especially concerning indigenous or settler relations. During an internship in history at Ballarat University, Paul Michael published a research project on William Buckley, a convict who escaped from an abortive penal colony in Port Phillip in 1803, lived among the Wadawurrung people, and assimilated into their culture until meeting the colonisation party in 1835 at indented head. Part of Paul Michael's research into this took in areas of a folkloric or legendary creature in Australia known as the Bunyip. In this episode of the Folklore Podcast, here is Paul Michael Donovan to tell us about Bunyip folklore in Australia. Hello, my name is Paul Michael Donovan of Federation University Australia in Ballarat, Victoria, and this is my podcast on the Bunyip. Modern Australia's folklore has developed over almost two and a half centuries since British colonisation, which has brought a cultural diversity to this continent. Stories, songs, traditions, rituals and ideologies from every corner of the globe have added to Indigenous folklore to create a uniquely Australian cultural identity. Despite the attempted genocide of Australian indigenous peoples and their languages and cultures through massacres, systemic violence and the stolen generation, certain aspects of their mythology and folklore have been powerful enough, interesting enough or pertinent enough to have been translated, adapted or appropriated whole as bolas into a wider mainstream Australian mythology. 
One such aspect of the Australian mythology is the bunyip, an umbrella term now ascribed to a variety of indigenous folklore about amphibious monsters. Bunyips were originally described in earlier colonial encounter stories as strange water-dwelling predators covered with feathers or fur. The bunyip is described as attacking and eating humans and was widely feared by contact area indigenous peoples, especially people of the Kulin nations, specifically at the Japurung, Wadawurung, Bunurung, Dongorung, and the Wemba Wemba and Wurgaya people, and then consequently by settlers. One of the most widely reported encounters with the creature is that it could often be heard bellowing and groaning in close proximity to waterways and lagoons. Its call was reportedly a distinctive two-tone booming which resounded in the night, striking terror into all who heard it. Variations on Bunyip legends are ubiquitous. A diverse array of such monsters existed in the contact era Indigenous Australian cultures. The Bunyip now features widely in modern Australian children's literature, and there have continued to be sightings of the beast by settlers since the 1830s. One of the earliest such sightings was reported by colonial explorer and escaped convict William Buckley, who lived among the Wadawurrung people between 1803 and 1835. He was the first European to integrate and live long term among the Wadawurrung people. Since the Bunyip mythology, in its Wadawurrung form, was recorded by William Buckley, it has transcended linguistic, racial and cultural boundaries to become central to Australian culture and become default term for all other previously independent indigenous mythologies relating to water-dwelling monsters. Now, William Buckley describes in his memoirs a very extraordinary amphibious animal, which the natives call bunyip, covered with feathers of a dusky grey colour about the size of a full-grown calf. The creatures only appear when the weather is very calm and the water very smooth. The natives had a very great dread of them, believing them to have supernatural power. As to occasion death, sickness, disease and such like misfortunes, they seldom remain long in neighbourhoods after having seen the creature. This was from William Buckley's memoirs. It's important though that Buckley's story was published in 1852 although it contains stories from his life between 1803 and 1835, including indigenous folklore, language and other anecdotal histories. This situates the use of the term and the belief in the Bunyip mythology to this period before European settlement in the area now known as Victoria. It is also important to note that Australia is home to 250 distinct indigenous languages, each belonging to its own indigenous country, which has its own distinct beliefs, stories, ritual traditions and politics. The Victorian Aboriginal Corporation for Languages, the VACL, identifies 38 languages and 11 language families in Victoria alone. Many of the 38 languages are further divided according to clan groups and their traditional lands. When examining the story of the Bunyip, it's important to distinguish Buckley's Bunyip from other indigenous mythologies, non wadawurrung stories, traditions and reported sightings of other lagoon-dwelling and amphibious mythological beasts that have been reported from both indigenous and non-indigenous people throughout the centuries. Unidentified creatures whose descriptions resemble a variety of physical characteristics, ranging from crocodiles, emu, platypi, and thylacines, to things like diprotodon, codfish, seal, and manatee, and various other actual and mythological creatures. Their geographical origins range from the rainforests of Queensland to the outback of New South Wales, through Victoria and Tasmania. Among the Victorian tribes were variations on the Bunyip myth, as well as other similar creatures with other names, which were later assimilated into the Bunyip mythology. Early ethnographers such as R.B. Smythe, A.W. Howard, R.H. Matthews, G.A. Robinson and W. Thomas recorded indigenous language across southeast Australia and their lexicons indicated distinguishing local variations on the Bunyip myth. The word Bunyip appears in Wadawurrung, Jaborung, Dungwurrung and Woiwurrung mythologies. The Bonwurrung people called the Bunyip Turudun. Ideas of the Bunyip on the Murray River and along the coast and the swamplands of the Western District also existed but originally had other names. Like the Bunyip, a giant supernatural snake named Mindai was ubiquitous among Port Phillip tribes, 
over a large portion of the central and northwestern district of Victoria. There was also Moorabool, who lived in a deep water hole in the Moorabool River, and Turu Dun, who inhabited Stalls Creek near the township of the modern day Turidan. Similar amphibious mythological beasts in this area. Doubtless, countless others existed elsewhere throughout Australia. Many of these independent mythologies have been retrospectively homogenized by non-indigenous writers and then categorized as bunyips. Bunyip, after this point, in the early contact era, became an umbrella term for mythological creatures, which are independent and have no connection to the Wadawurrung and Jalpawurrung bunyip. The one commonality is that they all almost invariably inhabit deep water. The term bunyip originated as a cool-in term from central and western Victoria. The term first appeared in print in the Geelong Advertiser in 1845, announced as a new animal discovered in the colony of Port Phillip. This article documents the use of the term bunyip seven years before William Buckley's publication of the term, indicating that that word existed in the area before Buckley published it. The article is about a bone fragment, positively identified by independent Wemba Wemba people as the bunyip, and describes that the creature in some detail, based on sketches, verbal descriptions of the creature given by the identifiers. The article assumes the bunyip to be a genuine, either living or extinct animal, rather than an indigenous mythology. In the Tasmanian Journal of Natural Science in 1847, Ronald Gunn attributes the origin of the Bunyip mythology to the Port Phillip Aborigines, a generic term for the Kulin people. This authenticates William Buckley's use of it there. Gunn also describes the physical and behavioural attributes of the Bunyip taxonomically, as if it were a real animal. Quote, about the size of a calf, with the head and neck of an emu, the mane and tail of a horse, tusks and flippers. He also states that it lays large eggs in a nest similar to that of a platypus. And he links the term with several other terms from neighbouring languages to describe a, a similar beast. An indigenous sacred site near Chalicum, near modern day Ararat in Japurang country, a ground drawing of the bunyip was carved annually into the ground until about the 1950s by the local indigenous people to commemorate an event mythologized in their folklore where an Aboriginal man and his brother were attacked by the bunyip. When the man had been killed, his brother speared and killed the bunyip, leaving its body on the ground. When their people came to organize the funeral of the killed man, they traced the body of the bunyip onto the ground, heaping land onto the silhouette, and then returned annually to recarve the figure to memorialize the event at around about the same time every year, and to share that story of the bunyip. After the last Aborigine involved in that ritual died, the site was fenced off for its conservation, but eventually grew over with grass and weeds, and was reopened for the running of cattle, which destroyed the site, leaving no trace of the geoglyph. Given that the above sources agree in situating the origin of the origin of the term among the Kulin languages, and these people were on good terms and in frequent communication in the form of intertribal marriages and gatherings, it is probable that the oral traditions and mythologies were shared among these people in contiguous countries. Given that the Japurang Bunyip seems to be the only one in the group with a providence in an event, actual or perceived, it seems that this is the origin of the Bunyip myth passed orally to other countries surrounding, potentially as a warning against an actual danger. Though, this is hard to verify exactly. Through kinship net networks and fraternization, fear was evoked in a creature that nobody had personally seen, but everybody knew someone who had, a kind of like an urban legend. Stanbridge's explanation in 1857 of the stars and astronomy representing two men who fought the bunyip, one being its victim, the other its slayer, tend to agree with the earlier accounts of the two men who encountered the beast near Chalicum in Jaburung country. Philip Clark claims that the bunyip originates as a Wemba Wemba or Wurgaya word. However, while his sources indicate that the word and its variations, Panip, Ponip, Panip Dor, Wim Bunip, Bunip, and Bun Yip all exist in those languages, there is no evidence that they originated there. These languages are culturally and geographically contiguous to Jabwaran country, and Clark has not made the connection with the originating myth of the Chalikan Bunyip, 
whose ritual tradition predates the Murray Down Bunyip. Now, I argue that the Japurang Chalikam version of the Bunyip is the root of the tradition and the root of the word, which has then been passed on to the Wemba Wemba, Weragaya, and others in the area. William Buckley was one of the foremost sources of ethnographic information on contact-era Wadawarung culture between 1803 and 1835. His memoirs, titled The Life and Adventures of William Buckley, 32 Years Amongst the Aborigines of the Then Unexplored Country Round Port Phillip, was published by John Morgan in 1852. In 1803, William Buckley escaped the Sullivan Bay Penal Settlement, now Sorrento, Victoria, and survived against all odds to live among the Wadawurrung Balog people. Buckley's account of the Bunyip is brief in his memoirs, but along with a variety of newspaper articles from around about the time that Buckley's memoirs were published, he may well be the catalyst to this obscure pre-contact Coolan myth exploding into the broader Australian zeitgeist, and thus eventually making its way into mainstream popular culture as an Australian equivalent to, say, Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. The fact that Buckley cites Bunyip as the Wadawurrung word for the animal is significant. This situates Bunyip mythology in the area around modern-day Geelong and Ballarat in times pre-European contact, and offers an attempt at a description of the beast. The sketchy nature of the description, and the fact that no Wadawurrung people had ever personally seen the animal, yet they literally believed that it existed, indicates a second-hand knowledge of the Japurung myth from the Chalikam ritual. This incident positively identifies the mythology as local. James Bonwick wrote on Buckley's life, after Buckley's death, adding a broader context to Buckley's life and times through ethnographic inquiry into Wadawurrung histories and mythologies. Quote, assuming a role of a critical, unbiased historian, end quote. So, as to provide an educational, academic history of Buckley's time with the Wadawurrung. Bonwick makes no reference to Buckley's personal encounter with the Bunyip, Though he, like other documenters of his time, asserts that the Bunyip is an actual creature, rather than a superstition or a myth. Quote, Among the superstitions has been placed in their belief the fabulous Bunyip. This monster was said to issue from the lakes and carry off children, even women. The natives never attempted to kill one. Some early stock keepers asserted the presence of a large amphibious animal covered with hair, but since the more complete settlement of the country, the Bunyip has disappeared to dwell with the banished ghosts and fairies of the olden time. End quote. Following the first time the word Bunyip appeared in print in July 1845, announcing a new animal discovered in the colony of Port Phillip, the mythology took on a new form. Settlers were discovering a foreign and exotic environment and attempting to understand an alien landscape and pantheon through a lens of well-entrenched Eurocentric naturalist and supernaturalist paradigms. Once the story of the Bunyip had entered into mainstream colonial culture through the media, settlers were wary of the dangerous creature and began citing it in their work and in their travels, lurking in the shadows around deep water. This became a concept with which to explain the unknown through a comfortable term. One of the first incidences to validate the Bunyip mythology as an animal in colonial Victoria was the finding of a then unidentified skull in the Murray Downs Murrumbidgee area. Shortly after this incident, there were a spike in reports of other Bunyip sightings throughout the New South Wales colonies. In 1847, the skull was originally shown to several Aboriginal groups who had not been in communication with each other, all of whom identified the skull as positively as having belonged to a bunyip. The skull was exhibited in the Colonial Museum of Sydney, but later on scientific examination proved to be the skull of a severely deformed horse. It is from this incident that the common idea that the bunyip myth originated here in Wemba Wemba country, in the Murray Downs area, and from the Wurgaya people as it did exist in their language. However, that is not to say that it did actually originate there. The article from the Geelong Advertiser and the Squatters Advocate, Friday 19th of February 1847, page 3, states that the local names of the beast at that point 
in Wergaya and Wemba Wemba country were Kinpreti, Katanprey and Tanaraba. But it compares it with the bunyip from Karangamite, which is William Buckley's bunyip. This also suggests that the bunyip did not in fact originate in Wemba Wemba country in the Murray Downs. Between 1845, from the wonderful discovery of a new animal in the Geelong Advertiser, and 1847, with the finding of the skull, the story had been distributed verbatim to newspapers throughout the Australian colonies, from Sydney to Hobart, right through. And a wave of sightings then ensued all over Australia. People began describing their sighted beasts in terms of very different from the original nightmarish, man-killing, wayward, seal-cut creature, and began describing the animal as everything from the mundane turtles and crocodiles, cows, camels, even a whale, to the supernatural, dragons, sea serpents, kelpies, spirits, nymphs, dinosaurs, etc. Thenceforth, we find different types or versions of the bunyip starting to appear through local myths. The later descriptions of the bunyip, having the head of an emu, features of a crocodile, etc., are all post these events. Now, from contemporary sketches, the geoglyph of the Chalicum bunyip, sighted in the Japurung country near Ararat, bears a striking resemblance to a seal. The descriptions of the original bunyip mythology also bear a striking resemblance to a seal. Coupled with the occasional, though extraordinary, appearance of seals who accidentally swim into estuaries and become trapped in land up rivers, this has led to the dominant theory among anthropologists and folklorists that the origin of the myth was actually an attack of a seal in an indigenous country where the men involved had never seen a seal and had no reason to know what one was. Many scholars and cryptozoologists agree that the origin of the Bunyip mythology, before it was homogenized with other myths as we discussed here, stemmed from inland indigenous communities having no knowledge of marine life encountering these wayward seals who had strayed inland, thus mythologizing their appearance and passing the experience through oral tradition. Seals can be found in inland lakes and waterways after flood ties. This theory is in keeping with the fact that the Chalicum bunyip resembles a seal and that all the original indigenous accounts of the bunyip were in keeping with this description prior to the press release in 1845 where it takes on a fantastical dimension. Astrological traditions from the Wemba Wemba people agree with the story of the Chalicum bunyip offering a continuum of that oral tradition from Japurung country, the place which mythologized the event, and into Wemba Wemba country the region usually purported to be the origin of the term. As the myth reached the interstate newspapers, settlers, journalists, fishermen, farmers and folklorists developed an awareness of this idea of the bunyip and were thus on the lookout for such a thing in their daily travels. Immediately, other mythologies began to be identified as types of bunyips, Aboriginal mythologies and descriptions of crocodiles and other predators and other animals were superimposed onto that Jaburung idea which was foreign to these places such as Sydney, Hobart, Perth or far north Queensland. Sightings of other strange and unknown creatures began to be explained as bunyips and this had by this time become a familiar image, an elusive creature within our Australian taxonomical paradigm. Here new features begin to be added to the description of the creature until the result is part beast, part bird, part marsupial, part reptile and part fish. In a colonial frontier whose actual animals undermine everything the old world knew about taxonomy and fauna, fauna where such a ridiculous idea as a platypus, a kangaroo or a koala are actually commonplace, no confusion of attribute was too outrageous to be believable in Australia. This new myth wove its way into the modern Australian popular culture and folklore and appears in Dot and the Kangaroo, The Magic Pudding and myriad other fictional stories. And then from popular culture into science and academia where the bunyip has become the subject of the study of cryptozoology in Australia. Also, many towns in Australia have adopted the bunyip as their civic identity creating bunyip themed tourist attractions, although local indigenous people argue that the mainstream bunyip images are not in keeping with their mythologies. After 1847, 
The word bunyip was understood as a, a pan-Aboriginal term for any unknown thing which was to be feared and was used by settlers to describe unknown indigenous creatures and by Aborigines to describe feral and introduced species which they did not understand as part of their environment. Any reference to the bunyip which originates post-1847 or outside of the original Japwarang, Wadawarang and other Kulin nations and surrounding vicinity is a new and independent mythology, borrowing the name from the Japwarang myth and homogenizing a variety of creatures, actual and mythological, producing a modern colonial mythology with its own overarching identity, which has resulted in misunderstanding, homogenization, narrative fragmentation, and hence the confusion as to the image, appearance, and identity of the creature. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen. It's been a privilege. Thank you. The Folklore Podcast is written and hosted by me, Mark Norman. You can follow my research and writing on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash marknormanfolklore. The guest in this episode of the Folklore Podcast was Paul Michael Donovan, the Folklore Podcast Art Director is Melissa Martell. Find out more about Melissa and her work at www.mdmcreate.com. A supplementary e-magazine for this episode is available to download from the Folklore Podcast website. Click on Supplements on the Episode tab to find this and all of our other past supplements designed by Melissa Martell. Remember that Folklore Podcast patrons at any level receive all of our supplements as they are published, as well as other rewards. To become a patron from as little as a dollar a month and support the future of this podcast, please visit www.patreon.com slash the Folklore Podcast or link from our website homepage. Please continue to rate the show on your podcast provider Join our social media pages and share the episodes to help us to grow and develop. With your help, we can continue to educate and entertain our growing audience with these episodes. The Folklore Podcast theme tune is written and performed by Gurdy Bird. <laughs>